Our next speaker is Ankit Wall, who has been leading cloud infrastructure teams at Thoughtworks for the last four years. But he actually started out his career as a game developer and designer and made a program, a game, that actually taught other people how to code. He's so passionate about learning, which is why he's here today, to talk to you all. Thank you, Ankit. Give it up for him. Check. Right, thank you, Edward. Um, Right, it's really nice to be in uh, the same room uh, for this XConf. I did a talk at XConf last year. It was a completely online event given the pandemic. Uh, at this time, I was sat in my bedroom alone with a really nice shirt and just a pair of pajamas. And all I could see was just my face. Uh, so hopefully I get a little more feedback from you guys today and we can make this a conversation. Um, this talk is about um, the roller coaster, love hate, sometimes great, oftentimes totally dysfunctional relationship between application teams and platform teams. Um, so I hope that explains the title. And if you're expecting anything else, then maybe you're at the wrong conference. <laughs> but um, I'm hoping that today we can talk why and when these relationships or interactions go wrong. Um, what a potential solution to that could be, and how we can apply a framework that helps us consciously design these interactions for success. Now, this is unplanned, but since we're talking about product managers, maybe I'll start with just a poll. Uh, and Edward's already got your hands warmed up. So how many of us think that platform teams, though I haven't told you what platform teams are, need product managers? Oh, wow. Okay, then, okay, that's it, that's my talk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, okay. Anyway, let's align our vocabulary. So, um, platform teams, at least for today, we'll call these teams that you may have heard of as SRE teams, infrastructure teams, um, DevOps teams, or platform teams. These are teams that usually deal directly with the uh, cloud provider layer with they're writing Terraform against AWS or Google Cloud as well. They own the networking layer, the VPCs, the subnets. They usually own the CI, CD infrastructure. Um, then they'll own direct dependencies that applications need, like where will the containers run, the databases for the applications. These are teams that provision these cloud resources. Uh, and they'll own indirect dependencies, operational tooling, like logging, monitoring, maybe the DMZ layer with its reverse proxy and forward proxy and all that stuff. Uh, we'll put a box around all of this and call it the platform to today, and we'll call these teams platform teams. It might be more than one team. Application teams are teams um, that write custom software application that runs, that is aligned to a business domain or more than one business domain, and then runs on the platform, which means that the application teams are users of the platform, which means that application teams are cus customers of the platform team. Right. Um, again, so uh, how many of us today feel like I, or identify as working in what we have defined as an application team, writing custom software, maybe microservices? Oh, I can't see your hands, folks. Oh, there we go. Okay, okay. Quite a significant representation. Thank you. And how many of us feel like we work for platform teams? Okay, a significant representation. Great, fantastic. We got a healthy representation for both kinds of teams. So why do platform teams exist? Um, platform teams exist to basically abstract all this underlying complexity away from the application teams. So the application teams can just worry about writing um, code that aligns with the business domain, work in their domain of expertise, and they are more productive. Um, it's essentially to lower the cognitive load that application teams have to face to be effective. How we can measure this is by the same four key metrics. If the platform team is doing its jobs, then the lead time, the change failure rate, the time to recovery, deployment frequency should all improve for application teams and the engineering org. Um, and most organizations look a little bit like this. There are usually more application teams than platform teams. And platform teams hence also serve to uh, reduce duplication of effort 
uh, like we were speaking of before, and to also some central concerns around governance and policy compliance. Uh, so there seems to be a really good reason for both these teams to exist. The intent is all right, and it seems like there's a really clear boundary of ownership for both teams. Um, so the question is, where does it start to go wrong? Well, in my experience, it starts to go wrong in how these teams interact, or perhaps how a little, sometimes not enough design goes into how these teams should interact. What usually happens is when an application team needs something from the underlying platform, maybe they need a VM, maybe they need a database, maybe they need some configuration push to the load balancer, maybe they need a whole environment, they'll reach out to the application team, and the application team uh, will if eventually pick that work up and push those changes to the platform. Uh, how many of us have experienced raising such tickets or writing such Slack messages or emails to other teams to get what they need from the platform? Do you have experience doing that? Right, okay, that's quite a few of us. And is there anybody here who's ever looked forward to raising this ticket, writing this email to an external. Uh, it's the most universally annoying thing that we have to do as part of our day jobs, and we often have to do it. Um, it's sometimes the tickets and the forms and the emails aren't clear, so you'll end up with meetings trying to explain to the platform team what it is you need, and then the platform team, when they finally understood what you need, will put your work in a queue or their backlog, and when it's prioritized, they'll pick it up and take and push the change that they think you need, which may not even be what you wanted in the first go. So now you have this back and forth and this confusion and errors happening because of this handoff. So that sounds bad, um, but it's actually worse because since most organizations look like this, uh, this is what the interaction ends up with. And what that means is it's not just one platform team that's now dependent or coupled or blocked on the platform team, it's most of the application teams in the org that are blocked and dependent on the platform team. Um, so managers of these application teams start getting nervous because their deadlines are getting pushed. They'll start to have more meetings to align the backlog three months in advance. Uh, that usually doesn't go to plan and all they'll show up in the prioritization meetings of these platform teams, and then it'll be a game of loudest manager wins, and whoever is uh, the biggest bully gets their works prioritized. Uh, no hate, I used to love our manager for doing that for us. Um, right, I, since I am actually a platform engineer, I can share some perspective of how the platform teams feel in this kind of scenario, because a lot is usually written about this from the application team's perspective, but the platform teams are usually overworked, um, they and burnt out. They don't have any autonomy because they don't get to choose what they're working on, right? Their priorities are driven by other teams. They don't have any mastery because they don't get to go deep because, again, their deadlines are driven by other teams. And turns out autonomy and mastery are like the two key ingredients for motivation. So these teams are usually demotivated. I learned this on a Saturday afternoon Googling the symptoms of why I'm so demotivated. <laughs> but, yes. Anyway, so this is, we know we want to solve this from the point of view of application team and platform teams, but, and the individuals in those teams, but we also want to solve this from the point of view of an org. Because if I just move these arrows around a little bit, and does anybody want to take a guess what this looks like from a lean or a theory of constraints point of view? Right, that's like the Google stock image for a bottleneck. So that's, that's a bottleneck in the value delivery of your organization if these interactions are ending up like this. So, uh, not, so we want to solve this from a team point of view. We want to solve this from an org point of view. And more importantly, we want to not have these platform teams be self-defeating, which means they're actually making the four key metrics of lead time and errors worse. They, they were explicitly set up to improve these metrics. Uh, so what is the solution? It's time for a story. So this story is based on true events, and it's about a platform team that found themselves in an extremely similar situation, but they eventually managed to design, engineer, and sort of evolve their way out of this uh, scenario. Uh, this platform team, 
I'll talk in maybe the first person. So we are a platform team that owns a platform service. Let's call this the reverse proxy service. You can imagine this as just like maybe the external facing layer of the system where all public traffic uh, enters, then is subsequently routed to uh, downstream or upstream applications behind the reverse proxy. Um, it makes sense for this to be a platform-owned layer because you may want to do governance controls like single point of entry for all traffic. You may want to apply some firewall rules. You may want to apply some basic hygiene like rate limiting. These are platform concerns, uh, not something you want app teams to worry about. But importantly, the app teams also directly depend on this platform service because for their users to be able to reach their services, the appropriate Routing rules must be applied at this layer. Um, since we have a little time, the underlying tech we had chosen for this was Nginx, and that really doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is for the platform team to configure and sort of uh, this reverse proxy layer, uh, it meant we had to write one or more config files and push it via CI, CD, change management process to this platform service. That's the only thing that matters for today. Um, so we built it, and it was beautiful. It was highly sc available, scalable. Uh, it had zero downtime deployments with blue-green. It was on secure VMs, and it was completely automated, driven by infrastructure as code. So we designed it really well, except we did not design how our users would actually use this service. So naively, we are thinking it would look something like this, where an application team would reach out to us, tell us what they need, and we will configure that for them. Something like a ticket-based or talk-to-me-based kind of interaction. Uh, of course, it went as well as you can expect it to go, uh, which means it didn't go well at all. The interaction actually ended up looking a bit like this. Um, we would end up in calls with the application teams. We'd say, hey, what do you need? And then they'd ask, okay, what do you have? Then we'd go into this uh, amazing rant about how amazing this Nginx thing is that we have built. And then they would go into three, four whiteboarding sessions about the entire application and the API design. So now we're busy cherry picking all the useful details from all the noise that can help us identify what config to push. Uh, then there would be curveballs like, oh, it's Nginx. Well, I have some use cases for IP whitelisting for admin dashboards, and I have some use cases for content caching. Can you do that? These are things we hadn't thought about or expected, so back to the drawing board. Um, and because this interaction is so high touch, we run into the same problem is that we can only deal with one team at a time. So the rest of the three teams that you see grayed out here are teams that are waiting to talk to us just to be able to express their requirements. So their deadlines are getting pushed, their managers are getting anxious, and their teams are getting frustrated. Um, so overall, it's a pretty bleak situation, and it's not fun for any of the teams involved. Um, but with time, some hope emerged. By talking to one team, and then the other team, and then another team, as a platform team, we started building a deep empathy for our users and their needs. We started seeing a pattern in what teams wanted across one team to another team, and we started being able to map that to functionality this platform service should support. Uh, at the end of the day, they only needed a few, they only needed to they only needed to really tell us a few key pieces of information, uh, which is what are the public endpoints and how are they mapped to the private endpoints so that we can configure the routing. And some of them needed IP whitelisting, which we thought, okay, that's a good feature to support for our users at this layer. Some of them requested content caching. We said, okay, we're not going to support that because this is not an appropriate layer to support it. Doesn't matter, but the point is we are now constraining what features this platform service uh, supports. Um, we also realized that the most effective way of getting this information from the teams is not to talk to them at all, is to just give them a well-structured Google form. And to help them fill that form, we give them some documentation about what this uh, platform service is, what features it supports, and how to fill that form. So our interaction ends up looking a little bit like this. Um, this is much nicer because now we are no longer in long-winded meetings. There's no oversharing of information. There's a nice layer of abstraction between us and the application teams. They read the docs on their own time. They fill the form out. 
They don't need to know that this thing is whatever it is underneath. We don't need to know how all the APIs work. So it's, it's getting better. And from a platform team point of view, we have gone from being really, really stressed to now being a little more relaxed. In fact, we might even be getting a little bit bored because all we find ourselves doing now is converting Google Forms into config files. And that work is getting really uh, repetitive and tedious, and perhaps that's toil. So let's eliminate this toil. And what happens when an engineer is bored of repetitive work? They automate. So that's what we did. We sort of used. We, we said, why don't we ask these teams to, uh, instead of submitting Google form to us, just ask them to submit the same information in a YAML file, and we'll use a really simple templating script that does some validation and turns this YAML file into some Nginx conf and push it through a, a change management CI CD to the, um, to the service. Right. At this point, uh, what has happened is the platform team is completely decoupled from this direct dependency path for the application teams to get what they need. The interaction is a lot more structured, and the application teams have a better understanding of what the platform service is, how to use it, and they are working independently. So what that looks like for the rest of the org is that we have increased throughput by uh, taking ourselves out of the equation Managers don't longer have to show up to our prioritization. They don't have to wait for a human resource in the platform team to be free to pick their work up. Right. Uh, this was a really powerful moment when it happened or when something like this happened. Um, but what's our lesson here? Uh, so if we go back to our original uh, view of the platform and these teams, we have gone from a interaction like this to an interaction that looks a little bit like this. And what we call this, what we call that in that white box is self-service. And what that simply means is that instead of application teams interacting with the platform team, they're actually interacting directly with the platform. So how these teams interact is now like a first class design concern of when we are building that platform. So, that's good. Let's recap really quickly. We know that unconsidered interactions lead to bottleneck and frustration. Uh, so we need to design them, and we need to design them for self-service. Um, but how do we do self-service consistently across all our platform services? Um, does it always mean a config generator? Uh, sometimes when you say self-service, it invokes images of uh, developer portals with uh, GUI buttons that say, provision me an environment. Do you have to build that out? Uh, does it mean that all your platform services have to expose a REST API now? Um, so what I've found useful is um, to break down self-service into two components along two dimensions. And this is a framework that helps me think about how to uh, make most of the interactions from the beginning tend towards self-service. The first dimension is obvious, is autonomy. The interaction should be that the application team should be able to work independently without any dependency on an external team. That's the more obvious one. The one that's uh, less obvious but perhaps predictable by all our conversation today is product thinking. And I'm not an expert at product thinking, but I like to just paraphrase it by saying just keeping your end like users in mind, who they are, what they need, how they will use the platform service, and how easy we can make it for them to use the platform service. So if I leave you with just one image for today, I'll probably leave you with this image. Um, I don't have a name for this framework yet. I worked on a few, but none of them were catchy enough. So if you have a suggestion, you can share that. Uh, we could end here, but then no consultant presentation is really over without a two by two grid. So ladies and gentlemen, this is your first two by two grid for the day. You'll probably see more. So all we're gonna do is now try to apply this framework on the story we just heard. So just to get familiar, we have autonomy on the Y axis and product thinking on the X axis. And here in quadrant one, both are low. So that is not so good. And up in quadrant four, both are high. So we, we expect that's where we need to end up, and that's where effective self-service happens. 
Um, so if you go back to our story and try to apply this in retrospect, we start out at quadrant one, right? The teams don't have autonomy, and we haven't applied product thinking to the service, which means that um, nobody really knows what it is. It takes a lot of high bandwidth conversation to explain it to them. They don't know how to use it, and they can't work independently. This is the symptoms of this end up being meetings and lots of handoffs, and consequences of this can arguably be errors and confusion because errors happen and lost in translation things happen and handoffs. Uh, and also there's waiting, so there's more lead time because at least one you can't run independently. Next, when we started up building a deep empathy for our customers and understanding what they need and defining a feature set for this uh, platform service, what we were effectively doing was doing user research. And by doing user research and applying it to a platform service, making it easier to use with documentation, we move into quadrant two, where the interaction now looks a little bit nicer. It's characterized by onboarding forms and tickets and how to use documentation. And there are less errors because the exchange of information is so much more structured, but they're still waiting because they don't work autonomously yet. Finally, when we applied that last bit of config generator automation, the more important bit was we gave those teams autonomy to be able to run independently, safely. And if we apply that, we end up in quadrant four, and that's where we have self-service. Now, what this self-service looks like could be anything, but hopefully, if you have both high autonomy and high product thinking, you should end up with something that looks like self-service. Uh, there's one quadrant here that we haven't spoken about, so, and that's quadrant three, uh, which is high autonomy but low product thinking. Now, this is probably uh, the tricky one uh, because autonomy is the easier one to aim for when thinking of self-service. So let's do a thought experiment. Um, say we are back in, uh, back in this scenario where we're having a lot of meetings and we are sick, totally sick of it and things aren't great. And we decide to, okay, we know what to do. We need to make these teams autonomous and that's self-service. So why don't we do something like let the application team directly put an Nginx config to the uh, service. Uh, now, for a second, this looks like a good idea. And even if you look past the fact that somehow magically all their config, every team's config will play nice to each other, what we have done is we've taken the responsibility of understanding the tool, being an expert in that tool, um, looking up its directives, crafting an appropriate config from us to the application team. So we have transferred that labor to them. So we have increased their cognitive load, which is gonna make them less effective at their other day job, which is writing application code. So at this point, the platform team is not really being effective. What, mm, okay, we have time. In this case, there's another interesting thing that happens is there is a dependency. It's slightly hidden and it's reversed. Imagine you're, as a platform team, decide that, okay, the tool we chose is not good enough for us. We're gonna shift to a totally different kind of reverse proxy solution. And then you go about, do your research, do some spikes, and you find this awesome reverse proxy solution and you're very excited to adopt it. And you feel that as a team that owns the system, you should make that decision. But now you have to go to every single one of these teams and ask them to rewrite their configuration in the new tool's configuration language. That's never going to happen. You are stuck with this tool for the life of the system. So at least in this case, you've just reversed the dependency. So if we now think about quadrant three and we only focus on autonomy and not enough product thinking, what that ends up looking like is we're transferring the burden of uh, doing things right to the application team. We're overexposing configuration. I would call it a leaky abstraction, but it's not really an abstraction at all, at least in this case. Um, so the cognitive load for our users, that our application teams, is high. And when that happens, uh, errors and confusion increases. So maybe your change failure rate uh, is not so good anymore, even if you can work autonomously. Right. Uh, okay. Wait, sorry. Yeah. So that's uh, what the whole picture should look like. Um, I think if you want to use this to sort of map where you are in your org and your interactions with your platform team, or if you are like me, a platform engineer, uh, where you are in your platform services, um, 
That could be a fun exercise. Uh, I think I wanted to run some scenarios by us, but I'll circle back to this in the uh, Q&A time. Right. One thing that's important to note about this framework is that it is, as a platform engineer, you will find yourself back in quadrant one. And that's totally OK. Because every time you're thinking of new services, new features, you're going to have to talk to your users. You're going to have to do all that high bandwidth com communication. You may want to launch a pilot with a few teams and work really closely with them. And they won't be working autonomously. And everything will be ill-defined in the beginning. The trick is to remember that when you say this feature is an existing capability, you should find your way back up in quadrant four. And a measure of that could be, OK, what about the third team or the fourth team or the fifth team to use this feature? How is their interaction? OK, so finally we circle back to this, but I think this audience is, is way more enlightened. Uh, but I don't like this question because I like to flip this question uh, and simply change it to uh, do, product, do, do we need product thinking capability in uh, platform teams? So it doesn't mean you need to go out and hire a product manager. You, the current team could do it. Your project manager could do it. Your pet cat could do it. Somebody has to be doing it. Uh, but it doesn't mean you need an extra person. The extra person won't hurt if you have the budget for it. Uh, right. OK, that's it. Uh, the conclusion, three points most importantly. If you don't design these interactions, they'll tend to a bottleneck, which leads to frustration and waste. Uh, design them for self-service and try to think of self-service as a, being composed of autonomy and product thinking. OK. Thank you. I'm Ankit. And if you want to connect with me, there's a QR that goes to my LinkedIn. Uh, we have uh, a lot of time. Wow. So <laughs> are there any questions? <laughs> I, we can make up for the lost time in the beginning. Uh, yes. Let's make it an easy one to start with. Oh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try. Um, thank you. This is really great. Um, in some of the things that I've been working on, I really liked that you said that the platform team decided that caching was out of scope. How do you advise or what tips can you give for defining scope for this like massive platform and also dividing that scope between different platform teams? Yeah, that's a good question. That's not an easy question. <laughs> so I think one thing that like is really key and maybe doesn't happen enough is to plan from the start that you're going to start with one team, but you may want to evolve to be more than one team because your cognitive load as a platform team matters as well. You don't want to be a team that has expertise in Kubernetes, Elasticsearch, Prometheus, Nginx. That kind of team doesn't exist. Uh, so when you start off with a small team, you want to design for things that can be carved up into multiple team ownership later. That will help. And then probably the decision of what you want to support has to be a decision of what your, your, what your customers need. It probably has to come from that. If the customer's needs mean that content caching is really critical, is not like an edge case for one app team that can do it some other way, and it's then you want to have a platform service that fulfills that need from the beginning. Okay, cheers. <laughs> and uh, why I went back to this one is because content caching is a really good example of, okay, finally you decide, um, free to change my mind. We're done with the basics. Now we'll support content caching. So now you go back to quadrant one. You go talk to the team that really needs it. And then you figure out, okay, what are your needs? What do you want? Map that to a to a feature that you can sort of support in that layer, that platform service, and try to bring that back up to quadrant four. Uh, or you say, OK, not this platform service. We'll just start a CDN, and that CDN can be owned by this team or some other team, and that will be a platform service in itself. Okay, any more questions? Oh, this question, this question. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, maybe here comes your easy question. Uh, maybe it goes back to the basics of, you know, uh, for your presentation itself. Uh, I totally understand why self-service is needed. Thanks for the talk. Really helped to see that. But you have this lot of requests coming from the application team. How do you 
set aside time, you know, yeah. you know, to say, okay, you need to wait. I need to go and uh, develop this thing. So how do you wait off all this? Uh, uh, I think depends on who you is. If you're like a dev in that team, then that's very difficult. You need buy-in from management to be able to support you to do that. Uh, so yeah, good question. Uh, I think if you have significant buy-in from management, then they probably need to support that. Uh, I have experienced that previously where we did, in fact, a whole uh, uh, multi-card epic called productize XYZ service, and our manager was really supportive. Uh, even though none of our customer teams were ever going to ask, come to you and say, hey, man, productize this. Uh, that's something that we sort of uh, brought up to our manager, and they, had, they gave us plenty of support. Uh, so you need that to get it done, at least in my experience, yeah. If anybody else wants to answer any of these questions, you can raise your hands as well. <laughs> okay, do we have time? Okay, uh, since, are there any more questions? Okay, I'll take one question, then I'll do some asking of my own, yeah. yeah thank you. I'm here because that's slightly creepy when you hear the sound and cannot find person, right? I tried to before, so I'm here if you're really interested first. Uh, so, first of all, right, I mean, I really loved your picture with uh, product manager and uh, the idea, right, I mean, for platform team. So, and probably I, I want to contribute to your idea, right, I mean, well, yeah, this one. So, we can say that what if product, uh, sorry, what if platform team is the kind of product, right, I mean, itself. And we say, do we need a product manager capabilities for team or for the platform, which is a product, right? And the answer will be pretty straightforward. Of course, no. Right. Hmm. Oh, yes. Once again. So uh, going back to my question, right? I mean, so when you're transitioning, let's say, from probably uh, position number three to position number four, right? I mean, from your magic quadrant, right, or something, three to four, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so okay. because, I mean, the situation with number three, I believe, quite typical, right? We can recognize many self-services that we think they are brilliant as uh, platform team, but they are actually in position number three. So when you transition from, from three to four, and typically when you're in that position number three, you have a lot of documentation, right? I mean, for a service, typically, right? I mean, maybe notes, maybe docs, articles. We have videos, for example, right? I mean, where I talk, for example, how to use that. So the question, do you think, or based on your experience, right? When you finally move, or you think you move to position number four, do you really need documentation and how that documentation or interface, right, for your self-service should look like, right? And right. how significant that documentation should be, right? Because we have different examples and, yeah, so documentation was a part or interface part. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. All right, that's a good question as well. Uh, do the product managers want to crack at this? <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, at least in my head, uh, you need to communicate with your users how to use. So if documentation is an effective way to do it, then that's totally fine. So I wouldn't be prescriptive about what the implementation looks like. It's like as long as um, your users think that it meets their needs, it's easy to use, and you have a high enough adoption rate if your platform is uh, not mandatory, then that should be okay. Uh, but that's a really good question because we haven't spoken about the journey from three to four. And I feel like that's a really interesting one. And in fact, it can be really low tech. So I have, again, a lot of time. So I'll ask some questions now. So, okay, imagine a scenario where uh, you are a platform team and you have created, are people folks somewhat familiar with Terraform here? Uh, okay, fine. So you've created a reusable module that spins up a database, uh, and the application teams are free to somehow invoke this module. And then in this module, it's highly configurable. You can tell it what subnet, what networking configuration you need, uh, what uh, uh, database type, and what's the size of the database you need, all that jazz. It has everything. It's really powerful. Um, so where do you think that would end up in? On which grid do you think that would end up on? Like, it's, it's, it feels like it's self-service, right? 
because, okay, it's reusable and it has really powerful and the app teams can just use it. But one can make an argument that it's actually in quadrant three because why does the app team need to configure the networking details? That's cognitive load for them. So how do we take it to quadrant four? It could be as simple as just send some, some sensible defaults for that module. I create the same module, it's the exact same technical uh, implementation, but I just make it a lot more usable by having defaults. And the app team just has to sort of invoke it and they don't even need to more often override any configuration. So it can be as simple as that to end up in Quadrant 4 and you don't really need any fancy tooling or uh, a new kind of solution. Mm, okay, I think I'm good. Uh, thanks, folks. <laughs> I have more questions, but maybe I'll save some time. All right, cheers. Thank you.